Amen. Something we don't do a lot is get to pray together, and that's uh, it's an awesome, awesome thing to do. Um, I think I think this is a good time to uh, just thank the uh, the tech team, uh, the IT team, the the audiovisual team. So. These guys come in every every Sunday and they just do a great job behind the scenes and uh, we're Facebook Live right now and uh, Josh heads that up and I know a lot of people watch the the video and uh, so I'm totally just blessed to have folks like this that just give sacrificially of their time and their talents and uh, that's the church, isn't it? So it's good and thank you for praying for each other and the Bible says this, pray without ceasing. So we are to never give up praying for God's will and God's work and the kingdom and one another. And so I pray that you've met someone new today. I pray that you have not only met someone new, but you're, uh, you're aligned with them and where they're at and be able to pray for them this week and maybe follow up next week with them. And uh, it's a wonderful gift to give each other uh, the gift of prayer. So um, let's do that this morning. Let's pray and dive into Genesis chapter 6. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the focus that is on Jesus. And really, there is nothing more worthy of our attention than to consider him who gave his life for us, and through his death, we might have life. And I pray that that life would be brimming and overflowing and so encouraging to us today and so hopeful for us today. Thank you for giving us this time together. Lord, be glorified in all that's said and done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 6 this morning. I don't know if you, uh, you heard the news this week, but there was a, uh, a man that was paid as an archives director in Spain for a decade. So what an archives director does, uh, I don't know. I think he directs the archives. But he's, uh, he's in Spain. He clocked in and clocked out every day for work for 10 years and never did a stitch of his job. Can you imagine going to a location, clocking in, and then leaving and going to do whatever you want? And for 10 years... This man went undiscovered in doing a job that he never really did, but got paid for it for 10 years. Well, guess what? He's out of a job now. He was found out and fired, and now he's on the government's list as someone that you should never hire. No duh, right? Uh, and I think about that, and uh, I don't want this to be a clock in time for God this morning. I don't want you clocking in here and be like, hey, all right, reporting for work, and then leave and not have anything to do with God outside of this place. Do you know people that clock in spiritually? They clock in like, hey, yeah, I'm representing God, and then they leave, and God's not even on the radar. This morning's message is aimed at us to really see where our hearts are at. Because I, I want you to know, God doesn't want us to show up for a job. Job is, is, is time-bound, right? Um, your spiritual walk is not time-bound. Your spiritual walk is something that is definitive of who you are 24-7. While I'm telling you not to clock in for a job, what I am encouraging us in this morning is this, to really consider where our lives are at with God, not right here, right now, but outside of this place when we leave. At your work at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. With your wife on Tuesday night at 5 o'clock when you're eating dinner. Your relationship with God means more out there than it does here right now. And God is going to challenge us this morning. God is going to use his word to once again examine our hearts because here's what we don't want. We don't want to play games at this thing. This is too serious of stuff to, to, to just kind of tri trivially. Your walk with Christ is of the utmost importance. More important than Croatia beating France. Amen? Look, we hope, right? More important than what's going on in our economy. More important than, you know, your future education or your future, you know, marriage or your future. What is most important now and forever is your relationship with Jesus. And that's what we want to hit on today. 
So turn your Bibles to Genesis 6, and we're going we're gonna to dive into eight verses of some of the most confusing stuff in all the Bible. Men and women through the ages have wrestled with the verses we're going to look at, and my prayer is that as your pastor, that I'm able to teach this in a way that not only clears through the confusion, but more importantly, we get to the heart of God and what he wants us to learn from this text. But for just brief moment of review, and for my wife, who is always good at saying, you know what, I wish you would have touched on this last week and you didn't. Well, here we go. I want to touch on the topic of, are we to believe that men and women lived into their hundreds, right? Last week we're in Genesis 5, right? And you're like, so-and-so lived to 600 years old, and we sit there and scratch our head and go, what? Is this, is this fanciful mythological material? Or did men and women at some point in human history live into their hundreds? Scientists that are either of the faith or, or not of the faith would agree that the longevity of lifespan thousands of years ago was much more different than it is today. And here's why. Two factors. Number one, men and women could live into their hundreds pre-flood or anti-diluvian days because number one, there wasn't the genetic difficulties we wrestle with today when it comes to the transference of diseases and illnesses. And so men and women back then didn't have to deal with the things genetically that we have to deal with today that often shorten our lifespan. But secondly, couple that with an atmospheric condition that was far different then than it was, is today. Back then, the earth was covered in a canopy of water that would allow some of the sunlight to come through, but it was more opaque because the earth was covered by this mist that watered the earth. See, this is what's so remarkable about Noah, the ark, and the flood, which we're going to cover in a few weeks, over a few weeks, is this. There's no such thing as rain pre-flood. It did not rain on the earth. The the Bible says that it watered the earth and all the plants and vegetation from the ground and from the sky, but it wasn't rain. It was a mist that came out of this canopy of water, and this is why the flood was such a monumental event, is that canopy of water opened up, and there was such a deluge of water that covered the earth. That is the only explanation from it, and you can see this in science, whether it's faith-based or not. And because of that atmosphere condition of canopy of water surrounding the earth, it allowed men and women to live longer life. And so that's why men and women could live to be 600, 700, 800, 900 years old. But after the flood, the lifespan of human beings is greatly reduced. Because now the atmospheric conditions are different. And so that's how men and women could live such longer years then. Okay. Teacher Scott steps aside, now Pastor Scott, Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at this passage. There's really two topics we're going to cover in Genesis 6. And and this is why the Bible is remarkable. This is why I think I'm going to do that Questioner's Cafe in a couple weeks, because we need to look at the Bible and and consider it more than what the, the critics and the skeptics consider the Bible to be, because they'll consider things like the age of man or even the, the account this morning we're going to look at as, as mythology. And what we believe is not mythology. What we believe is history. How can we trust the Bible? How can we trust what it says? How do we weigh the things it's teaching and explaining to us? And so that's my joy and that's my honor to be able to do this with you so that we realize that the Bible is what it says it is. It is the very word of God. And it is different than any other religious text. Jesus is different than any other religious teacher. And I'm going to tell you that Christianity rises head and shoulders above any other spirituality in the world because it, what it claims, it backs up through verifiable, objective proof. And no other spirituality can come close to that. And this is a hill I'm going to die on. Genesis chapter 6. Two things we're going to talk about. Humans or humanity and great sin. And the second main point is God and greater grace. See, this morning we are going to see the widespread impact of sin. And we're going to see not only the widespread impact of sin on the culture at this time, but God's assessment of this culture. 
and what he proposes to do. And what we need to realize is that though the sin on the earth at this time is great, God's grace is greater. See, my prayer this morning is that we would understand Romans chapter 5, verse 20 that says, you see how far sin goes? Well, you need to know that God's grace goes further than any distant sin is able to go, right? His grace is greater. That's our hope this morning as humanity. No matter how deplorable our world may look, no matter how deplorable our own lives may look, God's grace is greater than all of our sin. Amen? So that's what we're here to celebrate. Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at the first eight verses, and then I want to go back and, and really talk through this with you guys. So Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he, is also, uh, he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who are of old, men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from the man, uh, from man to animals, to creeping things, to the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So this is an interesting passage. And, and, and honestly, first pass, we're looking at this going, what is going on here? And, and I'm, I'm thankful to God that we are not a, a, a community that, of people that love Jesus that are just like, you know what, let's just pass on this one. Let's talk about Noah's Ark, shall we? Let's just, let's just pass over this because, I, like I said at the beginning, this is one of those passages that would be one of the most complicated passages in all the Bible. Men and women look at this, and, and there's a whole host of issues that really spring forth from this. Number one, who are the sons of God? Number two, who are the daughters of men? Verse four, who are the Nephilim? These guys are interesting. Number, five, number four, God's sorry? Like, if God's sovereign and he knows everything, how could God be sorry and he regretted making man? Like, did he not know this was going to happen? And then all of a sudden, Noah is introduced into the human race, uh, to the human race. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff here that I want to sort out. And I want to encourage us that it's maybe not as complicated as we would make it out to be. That there's actually really good stuff that God wants us to, to learn this morning. So let's deal with the, the, the bad stuff first, okay? Let's talk about humanity and great sin, shall we? It sounds like a good topic for a Sunday morning, right? So humanity and great sin. So there's a couple of things we need to consider uh, here in these first few verses. So if you remember, and again, when it comes to the Bible, it's kind of like buying a house, all right, you go out with a realtor, and what do they tell you the big three things are? Location, location, location. Well, the Bible, here's a great rule for studying the Bible. Context, context, context. Okay? Too many people pull things out of the Bible, and I sit there and go, no, that's not what it means. Right? You need to read a, a verse and read what's before it, and then what comes after it, and understand it in its context. So, let me set this passage up in context to what we just read over the past couple weeks. Chapter 4 of Genesis, we're talking about the line of Cain. Chapter 5 of Genesis, we're talking about the line of Seth. Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, wants us to understand that there are two groups of people on the earth at this time. There are those that belong to the family of Cain, 
and there are those who belong to the family of Seth. What do we know generally about the line of Cain? That these were men and women that did not want to do the will of God. They were unrighteous. They were ungodly. They'd rather boast in their technical triumphs and their achievements than submit to the will of God. We saw the picture of Cain and his lineage, and it was, a tr- it was a group of people that excelled in so many wonderful advances culturally, but they missed out on the biggest and most important thing, and that was a spiritual relationship with God. L- Cain's line is definitively known as a line of unrighteous people. Then we come to chapter 5, and Moses wants to present to us, though there is unrighteousness in the world, there's a glimmer of hope, the line of Seth. These are men and women who wanted to do the will of God. The line of Seth represents the opened promise once again that God would deliver humanity from their sinful state as promised to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where she is told by God, I will bring a deliverer through your seed and your seed will crush the seed of the enemy and he will ultimately triumph. And so this is something that the early people believed in that God would come through in delivering them from their sinful state, hence the celebration of the line of Seth. That's why at the end of verse uh, of chapter 4 into chapter 5, it says, when Enosh was born, then people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So there's good news, right? So now the line of Seth represents a righteous line. It represents a line of men and women who have a heart for God. Now we come to chapter 6, and we're going to have the two groups meet. The two groups are represented in the sons of God and the daughters of men. Moses wants us to understand these two groups as the coming together of the line of Cain and the line of Seth. And what we have now is the sin of contamination. This is why the sentiment of God was sorry that he had made man. Because here are men and women coming together, the righteous with the unrighteous, the godly with the ungodly, and now they're mixing their cultures, and God calls that contamination. He calls that a defilement of purity, and this is not what God wants. Now, let's just take a step back. There are some who would teach, and I would disagree with them, that the sons of God are actually angelic beings who took on human form, copulated with human women, and gave birth to some demonic offspring we're going to call the Nephilim. Talk about feeding the mythological narrative like in ways you don't want to deal with. Some in the evangelical church have taught this. As a matter of fact, I would tell you it is the majority view. But to understand the nature of the angelic realm, one thing the Bible is clear on is that demons do not have a corporal form. They do not take on a human body. They are spirit. Jesus even said that demons are spirit, and because they are spirit, they have no bodies, and because they have no bodies, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So now how would we have angelic beings coming down, having sexual relationships with women, and giving birth to Rosemary's baby? I mean, who wants that? If you've never seen it, that's a scary movie. And no wonder critics of the Bible have a heyday with stuff like this and go, really? Like, there is this demonic offspring, and, and how, how do we know that demons don't do this today? And how do we know the person sitting next to you right now is not some sort of demonic offspring? Don't turn and look at the person next to you. But I sit there and go, demons have no bodies. They are not equipped to consummate a marriage. They are not equipped to sire offspring. These demons then would transmit some sort of weird cosmic demonic DNA and have this fertile sperm and bring forth this group called the, and I sit there and go, this is crazy. And their proof texts don't even come close to defining that this is what's going on in the text. They would just say, well, sons of God represent demons because of Job chapter one. Job chapter one doesn't say that the sons of God are demons. 
Matter of fact, they'll go to Second Peter. They'll go to Jude. You may want to write those down and look at them later. But I'm sitting here going, this is too fanciful to believe. Perhaps we're complicated in, way, in ways that we should not complicate it. Consider the intent of the author, Moses. Here's a man who's acquainted with marrying someone that is not of his faith. You remember who Moses married the first, the first marriage? Zipporah. She was of a different tribe, and he experienced conflict when he brought his spirituality to a woman who didn't share the same spirituality. Can I tell you, church in general, we need to be aware of contamination, generally speaking. The Bible says this, Jesus, and I want to quote Jesus because he's always a good person to quote, amen? Jesus says this in, in, in the book of, of uh, actually, no, Paul says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul's good in quoting things too, so 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, he says, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? See, in this context, he's talking about marriage. But I'm going to tell you right now that the Bible is clear when it comes to spiritually contaminating ourselves because what relationship does light have with darkness? We ought to be careful as people who are salt that we don't lose our, our taste. We ought to be careful as people of light that we don't mix with things of, of darkness. There are boundaries that are established. This is why God has, has set forth his commands. He says, you need to be careful because there's a world that will quickly contaminate your spiritual life. And this is what happened in, Ma in Genesis chapter 6. There is a contamination going on where godly and ungodly meet, and it shouldn't be so. It's specifically, they're intermarrying with one another. And I'm going to tell you, I've been in ministry long enough to deal with men and women who have married someone that didn't share the same faith they did. And I'll tell you what, it is a lifetime of headache and heartache. There are probably people in this room right now that would raise their head and say, I'll testify to that. And even my son the other day asked me, he goes, Dad, do we marry only people who love Jesus? I said, yes! And he said, he followed up because he's smart, right? He said, well, maybe in, in our relationship we'll, we'll, we'll introduce them to Jesus and they'll become Christians. I said, no, 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 we don't believe in missionary dating or missionary marriages here. You don't get married to someone hoping they, they love Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now. There was a famous pastor who said this, if you drop a white glove in a puddle of mud, that mud doesn't become more glovey, that glove becomes more muddy. What relationship does light have with darkness? Do not justify, here's the problem. The sons of God, the righteous line of Seth, married the daughters of men, the, 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 the unrighteous line of Cain, and they became contaminated so much so that they became hideous in the sight of God. This was not God's intention for them. And what was the, the criteria in which these men married these women? Notice, they saw that they were beautiful. Can I, can I tell you right now? You may look good on the outside, but if you don't have a heart for Christ, that is an empty relationship. Okay, I'm not judging you. If you don't know Jesus, I'm not saying you're not beautiful. I'm not saying that God can't do something. But I'm going to tell you right now that there's a spiritual vacuum that even yourself and your spiritual walk will not be able to change that person. I am a betting man, and I will tell you that 100% of the time when you marry someone that is not spiritually equal with you, you're not going to bring them up to where you're at. They're going to bring you down to where they are. Be careful. And yet we are led by what? But he's so handsome and she's so pretty. And I sit there and go, so? But they, we just, we're so good at justifying our behavior that when we just get locked into making a decision, even against pastor's counsel, you know what I just know? I just know, boy, two years from now, now you're going to call me crying because you're going to go, I made a wrong decision. It's interesting because it was God's will for you to marry that person, right? Because you prayed. You just felt right about it. But now it's God's will for you to get out of that relationship. Can I just tell you, raise your spiritual antenna. Raise the standard. They ought to love Jesus as much or more than you do. Someone once equated the relationship to, to like a race, right? 
you're just kind of spiritually running along, and all of a sudden you kind of look to the side and you see someone of the opposite sex right, like running right, right alongside of you, and you're kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Like, you just can't keep running. And then a little bit later, you look over, and they're still there, and you're like, oh, and all of a sudden you kind of come closer, right? And, you engage, and all of a sudden, you guys, because you're running, you're living life, you're doing your thing that God wants you to do, you find that there's someone that is just right there in step with you. And I sit there and go, that's what God wants. Not like, whoa, who is that on the bench eating Dunkin' Donuts? I'm going to go take her out, right? Like, you don't stop the race, right? And if they're ahead of you, maybe it's worth like, picking up the pace a little bit. But you never, ever settle. You never, ever say, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and lower my standards because, you know what, they're a nice guy, and they've got a good job, and they really treat their mom well. So do the demon-possessed Nephilim. You know, these guys do all that too, right? Don't do it. Don't settle. And I'm going to plead with my own children. I'm going to plead with you as a church. And not only in the area of marriage, but just in the area of relationships. Bad company corrupts good character. Paul says in Corinthians, we ought to be careful in your business relationships. I would be a little bit hesitant in entering a business relationship with a person who doesn't share the same faith you do. I think this is transferable to so many areas. That doesn't mean you alienate yourself from anyone who doesn't know Jesus and you become a monastic person that lives out in the desert. Who would want that? You engage in people and with people, but when it comes to serious things of life, you need to be yoked with those who share the same faith you do. And that is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? So that's what's going on here. Moses knows this from experience. That's why he's writing this. I know what it's like to just put your spirituality on the back burner and settle for someone who's hot or beautiful or pretty or whatever. It is not worth it. Amen? Honey, you, you have anything you want to add to that? Anything I'm missing out on? I would, I would never say that. No, right, right. When it comes to things, marriage, business, etc., you do not want to have that sort of um, depth of relationship with someone where you're in a business agreement, you're in a covenant of marriage agreement, you're in all these things. But yes, you are, to, you are called to be salt and light to the world. You pray like crazy. I'm going to tell you right now, and again, this is, I'm, I'm going to speak for, for myself. You're married to someone who doesn't know Christ. Paul says in Corinthians chapter 7, you who are spiritual, stay committed because through your, your life, that person may come to know Jesus. I know of several couples where the husband and or the wife converted to Christ 40 years into their marriage, 50 years into their marriage. One man I can think of in my mind on his deathbed. And can you think about the joy for that wife who probably labored year after year, decade after decade for her husband to share the same faith in the same Lord that she had for him at the moment he's leaving this world to say, I accept Christ. Don't give up. Persevere. Pray. That's what I would say. Don't be discouraged. This is why the church is so important. You come alongside people who are in marriages like that and say, you can do this. You can do this because I'm going to tell you right now that God wants to do something there. And it may not even be for the other person. It may be for you. But, be, but I'm, I'm speaking to those who are not even in that place yet. Don't go there, right? Don't even enter into it. And so I, as a pastor, have turned, I do a lot of weddings for couples that aren't, connected with church or don't have a pastor in our lives. And I've had a few couples come to me where one knew Christ and one didn't. And I sit there and go, I can't do your wedding. What? I've even had people say, can in the ceremony you just not mention God at all? I sit there and go, what? I'm a Christian minister. Like what? The power up there that we cannot see, I guess, like, you know, there's a lot of marriages I don't do. But when it comes to two couples who don't know Christ, boy, I tell you what, I want to be involved in their lives with the hope of reaching them for Christ, right? But if someone comes to me, I sit there and go, you know Christ and you don't, that is just a, a nightmare waiting to happen. I can't do that, okay? So there's the sin of contamination. And, and this is really a call to purity. 
this is a call to purity for us as the church. Live your lives as unstained by the world. Do not be conformed to the world, Romans chapter 12, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. Because here's why. I want you to write down this sentence. The world needs you to be the church. The world needs you to be a pure person. The world needs you to be a righteous person. Again, these things cannot come from ourselves. They come from Jesus, but he gives us and equips us the resources to be those people. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't contaminate yourself by the world standards because you lower yourself to the world standards. Well, the world and you do not benefit from that. But when you rise to the occasion and become the person that God wants you to be, the world benefits by you living righteously. Now, we do it for the glory of God. That's our, our, our main objective is because of what he's done for us. But people benefit when you pursue a life of purity. Amen? I love what Teddy Roosevelt said. Not that he was a theologian, but I love what he says here. Teddy Roosevelt said this, and we found the smallest font possible so no one could read it. So the man in the arena, listen to what he says. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man, oh yeah, stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither nor victory nor defeat. That is awesome. And if I could just borrow for someone who didn't necessarily mean to intend this to be a spiritual thing centered in Christ, I'm telling you to the church, get out there and live righteously. Lean on Christ who empowers, and however imperfectly that experience may be for you, here's what God doesn't judge. He doesn't judge you on perfection or performance. He judges you on earnestness and desire and yearning. Yearn for righteousness. Long for purity. And be the people God wants you to be and stop playing games. Amen? Because there's also the sin of celebration. Consider this. The reason Moses writes about the Nephilim in verse 4 is that, again, this is not some super giant race, right? This is not some, like, Lord of the Rings moment where Frodo or Bilbo or whoever is like, there's giants in the land, and these guys are so intimidating. The Nephilim literally means giants, but they weren't giants in the size of physical stature. These were giants in the sense of they were warriors. They had accomplished a lot of amazing feats, and they were highly celebrated in the eyes of the people, but they were not highly celebrated in the eyes of God. See, there's only one other instance where the Nephilim are mentioned, and that is Numbers chapter 13. And the spies go into the land that's flowing with milk and honey, the land promised them by God, and they come back and say, there's giants in the land, meaning there are men who are so accomplished in their abilities and talents, we'll never stand a chance against them. And there's the sin of celebrating what the world considers strong. And the Bible says, well, what the world considers strong, God says, I determine it's weak. The world considers something wise, well, I consider it stupid. Now, don't enter a relationship and talk like that, okay? You think you're wise, you're just stupid. Well, you lose an audience at that moment. But there's the sin of celebration where I'm going to center on the fact that God does not, he's not impressed with human achievements. He's not impressed by how many, you know, how, how warrior-like you are, how valiant you are. God is impressed with the man or the woman that has a heart for him through Christ. This is why Jeremiah chapter 9, such a, a powerful passage. Jeremiah says this, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, 
Let not the mighty man boast in his might, but let the rich man boast in his riches. Do not let these things happen. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. You want to know who the giants in the land are? They're the men and women who know and love Jesus. Amen? That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight. And the heart of a man and woman that loves Jesus says, I want to delight not in what the world celebrates. I want to delight in the Lord. I want to delight in what God espouses as, as important. And so we need to be reminded of this because there's a lot of celebration of people in this world who don't have a heart for Christ and people trying to pursue and I want to become the next Beyonce. I want to become the next, you know, you know, LeBron James. And God says, I'm not impressed with that. What I'm impressed with is a man or woman who oftentimes does not have fame and does not have fortune and does not have some sort of reputation. The world would even consider you as foolish for the things you pursue, but God sees it and says, you delight in what I delight in? You're a celebrity in the kingdom. You're mine. And that's exactly what I want to encourage. That's why Jesus says this in Luke chapter, I think it's 16. Yeah, he says to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. And again, that's what celebrity does. We justify ourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. See, be careful when you consider someone in the world as powerful or wise. You who know Christ are the most wise people in the world, even though the world considers you fools. So I'm glad to be a camp of those fools in the world. How about you? We should get t-shirts made. I'm a fool in the world. The people are like, what? Because Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. And it's weakness to those who think they're strong. And while the world flexes its brain muscle and its physical muscles, we go out and we exercise spiritual muscles and walk in purity for, this, for the hope of reaching people with Christ to remind them this world is not all there is. Amen? So there's the sin of contamination. There's the sin of celebration. Let's shift gears and talk about God and, and the greater grace. Are we missing any blanks? My wife's flashing me symbols. Are we good? Okay, God and greater grace. So here's the good news. What this passage tells us about the character of God. And this is where God needs to just take a moment, and he wants, he wants to look at our hearts. I was, there's a story. Uh, in China, there are schools that are experimenting right now with facial recognition software. So they have cameras set up in the classroom, and they monitor every student every 30 seconds for facial things that are going on. Happiness, sadness, anger, whatever. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to determine what kids are prone to violence, what kids are prone to suicide, what kids are prone to, to do well with certain times. They are looking at the face to try to determine what's going on inside. Is that crazy or what? And God uses heart recognition software when it comes to his word. And he's going to look at us right now. So consider these three things about God because here's how wonderful our God is. And I want you to hear the message of grace here. Number one, God is a righteous God. Number two, he is a relational God. And number three, he is a redeeming God. This is the grace of God. And no matter what we may not see, and I don't, I, I don't have facial recognition ability where I'm able to say, I can see your heart and I know what's going on in your heart. I want your heart to be convicted by these things in a sense that you're encouraged now to pursue him more because of these three things. Number one, he's a righteous God. And you want a righteous God. You want a God who is holy and he is just and he's quick to do business with sin. This is why we live in a system where there is a justice system. Because when someone commits a heinous crime, you don't want that person to get off scot-free, right? You want there to, what's the thing we hear in the news? We want justice! Well, spiritually speaking, you got to be careful when you say that before God. If you go before God and say you want justice, you obviously don't understand God's righteousness because of two things, the powerful nature of sin and the pervasive nature of sin. Look what God says here, verse 5. 
the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great, circle that word, great, on the earth, and that every intent, circle that phrase, every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Circle evil continually. continually. Can I tell you, verse 5 is one of those passages I'm like, can I just sharpie that one out in my Bible? Because I read that and I go, this is God's assessment of humanity. The Bible doesn't say, you know what, men, women, you're good. You just make mistakes once in a while. That's not God's assessment. I mean, write down Romans chapter 3 and look at it later if you really want to be encouraged, right, about how bad we are. God says that there's none who seeks after God, not even one. Your mind's not right. Your heart's not right. Your will's not right. And though we do things of civic virtue in our world, there is nothing we do outside of Christ that is of salvific value. See, when God in his righteousness looks at the human heart outside of Christ, verse 5 is what he sees. The powerful nature of sin is this. It has left us incapacitated and unable to do anything good in God's eyes. But the pervasive nature of sin basically says that we're not as evil as we could all possibly be because this room is not erupting in chaos where we have pitchforks and knives and axes and we're killing each other. That's a weird image, right? I just went Quentin Tarantino on you guys and you didn't realize it, did you? But there is a level of civility that we're not as evil as we could potentially be, but someone once said there's continual room for deprovement, amen? But here's the fact. Every bit of our faculty, every part of our humanity is touched by sin. It is tainted by sin. It is corrupted by sin. My will, my feelings, my emotions, my heart, my mind, every part of who I am, there is not a place in my body, physically or non-physically, that is not untouched by sin. And God sees it. He sees that my heart is deceitful. uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, the heart is deceitful. That there are words that that don't even make it to my tongue, but they're still inside of me. And God says, I saw it. I know it. And so we become, we come before a righteous God, hearing his assessment. And the thing we want to do is run. But yet the very thing we need to do is just submit. Surrender. Yield ourselves. Because the righteousness of God says this. Though I am righteous and though I am holy and though I am just, I'm a God who is full of grace. Who's going to do something for you which you can never do for yourself. I'm going to give you a gift. And I'm going to rescue you from your life of depravity. And I'm going to rescue you from your life of unrighteousness. And this is exactly what God does, which now shifts us to our second point about God. He's a relational God. He's a God who's involved in our lives. He's not a God who, at Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve rebel and disobey God, it's like the Bible doesn't end there. Thank God it doesn't. But he's a relational God who says in verse 3, look at this verse, the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. There's this idea that what Moses is saying is it is God's spirit that is in work in all of our lives. Without his spirit, we're dead. His spirit is the thing that gets us up in the morning and propels us through the day and keeps us sleeping at night. Read David's assessment of this in Psalm 104 this week. But his spirit says, I shall not strive with man forever because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Three things I want you to notice here. Number one, God's patience. Number two, God's pain. And number three, God's plan. I think it was Paul back at the slide said, boy, you got a lot of blanks this morning. Because this is, this is worth it. This is worth it. How is God relational? Number one, his patience with us. He's a God who strives with us. This is why he puts that number 120 years on there. See, there's two things we can interpret this as meaning. Number one, that, it, that man's life will be shortened, right? No longer 700 years, 800 years, 900 years. Man will have his lifespan, men and women will have their lifespans shortened. But I believe what he's saying is it's going to be about 120 years until the flood comes. And when the flood comes, it will be total devastation. 
So you have 120 years to get your lives right. I, I, I like those odds. How about you? you? You like the fact that God is long-suffering and you like that God is, is forbearing and you like the fact that God is patient? See, verse 3 says, there will come a moment when God says, I will remove my spirit from you. You will die, and if you don't have Christ, you will die apart from me. And thank God that he strives with us even today. And he gives us his spirit. Because here's, think about what God's thinking. I have given you my spirit so that, number one, you would live your lives to honor me and to glorify me and do what I say. And now he's looking upon creation that says, you have my spirit, but don't want to do what I want you to do. The creation is not living like the creator wants them to. Does the creator have a right to wipe out that creation? Yes. But yet God is patient. Turn from your evil ways, he says. Start and understand that your life is more than your job and your hobbies and your marriage. Your life is about being a creature created in my image. And now more than anything, I want you to live for me. That's why you're here. You ever been asked, what's the meaning of life or why am I here? There it is. Live in relationship with God. He has strived with you. He has walked with you. He's intimately acquainted with your life right now. And no matter where you've been and what you've done, and no matter what kind of sin you may be entangled with, the voice of God says, I love you. And this is his pain. He's such a relational God that it says in verse 6 that the Lord was sorry that he had made man and he was grieved in his heart. Grieving is a word of emotion. Grieving is a word that's involved in relationship. Grieving is something you do for someone you love and God loves us. And he sits there and goes, but you're not doing what I want you to do. This is why Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus wept. Because he sees what sin has done to humanity and he weeps. But that weeping doesn't mean he's not sovereign because Jesus knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to be buried. He knows he's going to be risen again. And we get to celebrate Easter that there's a God who identifies with us and is victorious over sin, death, and the grave. Can God be emotional and be involved in our lives and still be sovereign and victorious over it all? You better believe it. He's not a God who's controlled by his emotions in his grieving. He's a grieving God because he wants you to know how much he identifies with you. Read Psalm 139 this week. It's awesome. Number three, not only his patience, his pain, but also his plan. He is a redeeming God. Verse eight, but God... Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Two things to consider here. He's a redeeming God. This is his plan. In his patience, he's saying, I'm going to rescue you. And, and, and if you want to think about the Bible in one succinct statement, it's a God who rescues those who can't rescue themselves. And so he, he finds a guy named Noah. Noah's not perfect. Noah, his household is in disorder. But thank God he doesn't just choose people who are perfect and have all their lives in order. Amen? But Noah, it says, verse 8, found favor in the eyes of God. Notice, this comes before you know anything about Noah. God finds him. And this is how God redeems. He finds you. You don't look for him. You're not searching for him. He finds you. And here is his plan. That judgment will come upon the world, but there will be an opportunity for you to be redeemed. Two things to consider. Number one, biblical grace. And number two, biblical faith. The word in verse 8, favor, is the, literally the word grace. It's the first appearance of the word grace in the Bible. Verse 8. And it's connected with a wicked world that's about ready to experience expansive judgment. But the message amidst these, this culture is that God will deliver a family. Noah, 
and his children and their wives, and they will build an ark. And as crazy as it is, and we're going to unpack this in the weeks to come because the, the account of Noah is amazing and it is strange and it's weird and it's awesome. But that God says, I'm going to be a God who redeems you and you will be saved in the ark. And so biblical grace realizes that God gives you, which you that which you don't deserve. That's grace. And the moment you think you deserve it is the moment you don't understand grace. Noah would experience the grace of God. And I will tell you, God's patience, his delay is evidence of his grace. Because he could have taken me out yesterday. He could have taken you out two weeks ago. But you're here today. And you know why you're here today? You're you're here to hear this message, not about God's grace, but you're also here about God's uh, measure of faith that he wants to give you. Biblical faith. You are now held accountable for what you're hearing. Because Noah would be a preacher of righteousness among a culture that didn't want to hear it. And I'm sure there's some here that don't want to hear this message today. And I'm not going to take it personally. We're still friends. BFF forever, right? But I want you to know that the only way you are delivered for the, from the flood of judgment to come, because there is another flood coming. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 24, For as were the days of Noah, so there will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. See, even though there will not be a physical flood, because God promised that, hence the rainbow, but Jesus is clear in saying that every single one of you will die. And you don't want to die in unbelief. Because the judgment is coming against those who don't believe. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. I have come that you may have salvation. I have come to be your rescuer. I have come to be your redeemer. If today is the day of salvation, then turn your heart over to him. Amen? Because biblical faith involves three things. Write them down. It involves your mind. It involves your heart. And it involves your will. Your mind understands the warning of God. It is taking in information. Your heart fears for what's coming. And again, while fear is an incredible motivator, you're you're more enraptured by the fact that God loves you and he's being gracious to you. He wants to save you through Christ. But the mind moves the heart. But if it doesn't improve, engage the will, then it's not biblical faith. The will is the acting on what you're hearing. The stirring of the heart moves the will to do what God wants you to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, to have the mind enlightened and the heart stirred, but to not act in obedience to the message, that's not faith. God doesn't want you to just give intellectual assessment to his truth. He wants you to believe for all those three things about who you are as a human being have to be involved in order to be saved. Think about the story this week that had the entire world, their attention captured, the Thai youth soccer team. And, and I was like one of the first to like, I told my wife, she's like, what? And all of a sudden, like everyone is just paying attention, like what's going to happen to these guys, right? The coach, there's, there's players inside this cave in Thailand and this, this, this water came in and they were trapped. And all of a sudden, like, these Navy SEAL, like, scuba divers went in, and there's, like, this rescue mission, right? And all of a sudden, they brought out four, and then people were like, yeah, let's get the rest. And all of a sudden, they all came out, right? And I love the very first footage, right, of them walking in, and they're shining a light on these kids, and these kids haven't eaten anything in so long. And they're just like, hi, hi, right? Like, they're, like, the nicest kids. But it wasn't just a rescue effort, like, okay, let's just all swim out. These scuba divers had to train these kids who many of them did not know how to swim. But now they're going to learn how to be scuba divers in order to be rescued from a situation that they themselves could not be rescued from. And while it took energy and while it took days and while it took an incredible cost to bring all that equipment in and yet to get them out, they were delivered. Could they boast or take credit for anything that they did in that? No, it was entirely someone else's work on their behalf. And here they are today, all of them saved. 
Why? Because it wasn't like they just agreed to the terms of scuba diving lessons. It wasn't just, you know, it was like, oh, this sounds like a good plan. They acted. They took the step and believed in what they didn't understand, what they hadn't experienced, and they took the step and they believed. And now, because of their faith, they are rescued. God says, you're in a cave that you can't get out of. You are powerless. You have no experience in this. You don't even have the know-how. Trust me to be your deliverer. So maybe you've never heard of God being the ultimate scuba diver, but Jesus is a scuba diver who's basically saying, learn from me, take my yoke upon you, be saved, and find deliverance in him and only him. Amen? And that's where we just stop and say, hallelujah, what a savior. God will not contend with you forever. Can I just say that with all the, the love and, and just hope in my heart to you today. God is not going to strive with you forever. He will not keep striving with you in particular. He has no moral obligation to do this. There comes a time when God says enough. You've heard enough sermons. You've heard enough about Jesus. You've read enough in the Bible. You need to do something. And I'm going to encourage you this morning that you need to lay down your weapons. You need to end your rebellion. You need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born from above. You need to become a, become a new creature in Christ and follow him from this moment on. That's it. That's your only hope. It's my only hope. That's my prayer for you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you... Uh, Whoa. I, I read this text this morning and I, I shudder to think about the fact that, boy, if you didn't extend your grace like you have, I wouldn't know hope. I wouldn't know Jesus. None of us would be here. But yet you stepped into time to, to rescue us. And boy, we, we didn't deserve to be rescued. We're not like those Thai children who are nice kids. We're, you know our hearts and, and we're only wicked continually. And you do not have an obligation to love us. And yet you do. And so we are so moved by that. My prayer is that that movement would be towards greater appreciation for what you've done for us. In light of who we are, what's more important is who you are, God. And that you would rescue, you would redeem sinful people like us and change our hearts and make us new creatures and have us now live for a different purpose. So it has nothing to do with us, but it has entirely everything to do with you. Be glorified in our lives, Father. Guide and direct our steps. Let us live for your glory, and let us walk in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the message of grace. And we give you all the glory in the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.